Hello, everyone. I'm uh, Coach John at uh, NYU, and I'm going to be moderating this uh, CBR session. Uh, we have two great papers. Uh, the first paper is going to be Economics of NFTs, the Value of Creator Royalties. Uh, Brett Falk, Jerry Sukalas, and Niu Niu Zhang are the authors, and Brett is going to present the paper. We have a second paper that is Reaching for Yield in Decentralized Financial Markets. Patrick Augustan, Roy Chen Zhang, Dongwa Shen, and Donghua is going to present the paper. Each paper, including presentation time and Q and A's, have 45 minutes. Uh, the attendees can pose questions on the Q and A, and the co-authors uh, will answer that question. Uh, I can also interrupt the speakers uh, to ask some questions. Okay, I'm going to have Brett now take over. Uh, Brett, it's your floor. All right. Thanks. Um, so let me share my screen. All right. Can everybody see? Yes. Uh, okay, great. So yeah, so today um, I want to talk about um, creator royalties around NFTs. Um, and yeah, please feel free to stop me if you have questions. Um, there's lots of sort of fun stories in this space. So the, the motivation for this is there's been a narrative for a few years now, right? This is a headline from 2021 saying that um, giving creator royalties through NFTs is a way to empower artists. And so creator royalties means that the creator will get some percentage of the sale price of all future sales of their NFT. And there's tons of headlines like this about how the blockchain space is going to revolutionize the world for artists and empower artists through royalties. Um, and here's another headline. It's royalties are one of the most compelling features of crypto. Um, and so we wanted to talk about, well, what, what's actually happening in the NFT space and how do royalties work? So the, the counterpoint to royalties being um, super useful for artists is that maybe the royalties are going to get priced in. And so here's Hasib Qureshi on the chopping block who says, I don't think royalties are really going to make a difference if you have a royalty rate of two and a half percent. So the creator gets two and a half percent of every future sale. Those, um, those royalties are essentially gonna get priced in at the first sale and the, the creator will get less when they sell their NFT upfront. And overall, the creator will be left in the same situation with royalties and without royalties. So, so this is kind of the question that we wanted to think about is what, what role do royalties serve? Are they going to get priced in by the market or are they actually going to somehow be a game changer for, um, for creators? So before we get into any of the math, let's just talk about the NFT space. Um, in the last two years, there have been about $25 billion in annual sales in 2021 and another 25 billion in 2022. And um, there have been actually about one and a half billion dollars paid in NFT royalties on Ethereum alone and then some amount on other blockchains like Solana. And a lot of these NFT projects that maybe you've heard of, like the Board Ape Yacht Club or Doodles or Goblin Town, they've made the majority of their revenue from royalties, way more than they made from their initial sales. Um, so royalties are a thing, they're happening. Um, and so Here's the, the model that we're considering when we're thinking about royalties. We have a seller who has K units to sell, and this is modeled off this profile pick model of NFTs or PFPs. And the seller sets a fixed price and a royalty rate R. And this is again, how royalties are sold in practice. So something like board apes, there were 10,000 board apes that were created and they were initially all sold for a fixed price of 0.08 ETH and on, um, uh, on OpenSea, they asked for 2.5% royalties on all future sales, but there's a fixed sale price from the initial mint. 
And doodles are the same way. They like this number 10,000. It was set originally by uh, CryptoPunks, right? So a lot of people copied this. There were 10,000 doodles. They were all sold for the same fixed price and then the same fixed royalty afterwards. And World of Women had the same thing. Pudgy penguins had a few fewer penguins than, um, than the 10,000. Goblin Town had one fewer. Um, but this model, where um, you have a giant collection of these profile pick NFTs and you sell them all at a low fixed price and a, um, have a moderate royalty rate is kind of the motivation for our model afterwards. So the seller has some number of units to sell. Initially, we start with just one unit and they have to sell at a fixed price and a fixed royalty rate. So, so here's the, the sort of very simplest baseline model. At time zero, you have a creator who has a single NFT they wanna sell. They have to set a price. And at the time they set the price, they know there's going to be a buyer who has some stochastic valuation V for the NFT. So they're willing to pay V coming from some known distribution. And at time one, the creator can sell to the buyer if the price they, sold, they set was lower than V, otherwise the buyer doesn't buy. Right. This is like a very simple model and it's not hard to see here. The best thing the buyer can do, well, how much money is the buyer going to get in expectation? They get P times the probability that V is bigger than P, right? That's their expected revenue from this. And so they choose P to be the, the P that maximizes this value P times probability V is bigger than P. And now, if we remember from Markov's inequality, Markov's inequality says that this value, P times probability V is bigger than P is less than the expected value of V. And um, that you only have equality when V is degenerate, when it's supported on a single point. Um, so, so in this case, there, there's, a spec, there's a creator who's going to sell and they're not going to get E of V in expectation where V is the valuation from the buyer. And so the next thing we said, okay, let's add in a speculator here, right? And in the NFT markets, it's all about speculation, right? And so now we have one more time step. We say there's a creator who still has a single unit. They set a price P and they can set a royalty rate R. And at time one, now a speculator arrives and the speculator has to decide whether to purchase the item or not. The speculator has no intrinsic value for the item. They're only going to purchase the NFT if they think they can resell it for a higher price. Um, and then at time two, a buyer comes in. The buyer still has the stochastic valuation V. The distribution V is known to the creator. It's known to the speculator. Um, and if the speculator purchased at time one, they'll always sell for any non-zero realization V because they have no intrinsic value for it. Um, if the speculator did not purchase, the creator had set this price P and could sell it on this secondary market. And in this case as well, um, it's not too hard to see that um, anytime that the creator can set now, even without royalties, the creator could set P to be E of V, and the speculator, if the speculator has no outside option, right, and is willing to essentially take zero profit, the speculator can, will purchase for any price less than E of V. And um, in this case, the, the creator can earn E of V in expectation and the speculator will earn nothing. Um, again, it's very easy to sort of adapt this model if the speculator has some outside option and is only willing to participate if they can make some positive profit um, you can adapt it this way. But in the simplest case, if the speculator is willing to participate with any positive profit, the, the, spec, the addition of a speculator allows the creator to actually earn more, but the royalties don't help at all, right? The, the creator can set a royalty rate to zero and still capture all of the value from the speculator. So in this way, Hasib was kind of right. In this really simple model, the speculator the, the speculator increases the creator revenue. It went from P times probability um, of V bigger than P. It went all the way up to E of V, which was a, a positive step. Um, but the royalties do get priced in by the speculator. Um, the creator gets the same profit whether or not they have royalties. So this um, kind of is a, is a very simple model. And so we can ask, well, 
are there situations where royalties help? In this very simple case, royalties don't actually help the creator. They get priced in, just like Hasib argued. And so the main thing that I want to talk about is we looked at a few situations where royalties actually do help the creator. Um, so I'll talk about these three sort of variants of this model we considered where creator royalties actually give higher utility to the creator. So the first one is when the speculator is risk averse, then royalties help the creator. The second one is when there's some information asymmetry, when the speculator essentially has more information about the buyer's distribution V than the creator does, which seems like a plausible kind of assumption that if you have a creator, they may or may not be tuned in exactly to the market. In an idealized world, you imagine them as actually some artist who's not maybe so tuned into market dynamics. And the speculator, on the other hand, is um, someone who is paying a lot of attention to the market. So you could imagine the speculator has better information about this demand distribution V than the creator does. And in this case, creator royalties will allow the, the creator to piggyback off this extra information. And then the third case we consider is when the creator has multiple units, um, but has to set a fixed sale price for all of them. And this is how NFTs are usually sold. As I mentioned before, you know, with Bored Apes or Doodles, there are 10,000 of them and the, um, the creator sells them all at a fixed price. And for all these collections, now there's still a strong social pressure to do that. So I'm gonna just walk through quickly these three things and each one of them by themselves is fairly simple. So um, we can see sort of a little bit how these dynamics work. So we'll start with the risk aversion setting. So we imagine we have basically exactly the same model that we had before. There's a creator who has a single unit and they have to set a price P and a royalty rate R. And then at time one, the speculator arrives and the speculator knows the distribution V, but not the realization of V. And they have to decide whether to purchase. And then at time two, a single buyer comes and their, their valuation is drawn from this distribution V. And the speculator will sell at any price because the speculator has no intrinsic value. Um, and if the speculator didn't purchase, the creator can still try to sell, but the creator cannot change its price afterwards. And the only change we make is that now the creator and the speculator are risk averse with parameters A to C and A to S. And by risk averse, we just use this mean variance utility. So the, the speculator's utility is their mean of their, the valuation of the revenue they get minus the variance of their revenue. And the same thing for the creator, the, the creator's utility is the mean of their revenue minus the variance of their revenue. And it's pretty straightforward to show that um, when the creator and the speculator are risk averse like this, the optimal royalty rate R star is this A to S over A to S plus A to C. And the thing to notice here is that R, the optimal royalty rate, will be positive whenever A to S is non-zero. So um, when the speculator is risk averse. And um, then you can also calculate what the optimal sale price is. Um, but the, the interesting thing here, right, is that you actually get the optimal royalties is non-zero. And you can calculate easily how much extra utility the creator gets by having royalties by considering if the, the creator sets the optimal royalties versus sets no royalties. And the creator gets an additional, this is the delta, the difference between the amount of utility the creator gets with royalties versus no royalties. And sigma here is the variance of the uh, buyer's valuation. So um, the buyer's valuation V. And so again, um, the more risk averse the speculator is, the, the more revenue or the more utility the creator can get by having royalties. Um, yes, yeah, so uh, in terms of the chat that the, there, we're making the assumption here in this, again, in the simple model that the speculator can sell at the, um, at the second purchaser's valuation. So the, the, the the speculator, you could imagine the speculator has a lot of insight into the market and knows the second purchaser's valuation and can extract all of the value from the second purchaser. So that's the assumption right now, yeah. Um, 
And again, you can imagine weakening these assumptions a little bit, but just to make the, the things really clean here, um, that makes things nicer. So the second uh, example we wanna consider is information asymmetry. Um, and so in relation to this last question, we assumed that um, in terms of this, the so we say the speculator purchased the time one, they'll sell at the price little v, which is like the realization of big V. So we assume that always the speculator learns little v before they sell. And now we're gonna consider a case, we'll drop the risk aversion and just say we don't, even if they're not, there's no risk aversion, if there's information asymmetry and the information asymmetry we, um, we model is that basically the speculator learns the realization of V not at time two, but at time one. So that the speculator learns the realization of V, it learns the actual market demand before it has to purchase. Okay, so this is just a, a simple way to model that the speculator has sort of less uncertainty about V than, than the creator does. But you can also imagine different models here, but this is a, a really simple one that leads to some like pretty clean equations. So the speculator, the creator has to set a price P and a royalty rate R knowing only the distribution V, but the speculator um, gets to choose whether to purchase after they know V. And so we cross out this line because if the speculator didn't purchase, then that means the buyer's valuation was less than P and then the buyer won't purchase either and the speculator, the creator is stuck holding their unit. Right. Um, so this case will never happen in this model. Um, so the, the thing that's funny here is with this, if the speculator knows the realization of the valuation at time one, the speculator will only purchase if P is less than V. And now in some sense, the speculator just kind of became the end buyer. The speculator and the end buyer sort of collapse into one right? Because the speculator is going to purchase at a price P if and only if P is less than V. But if you recall from the very simple baseline model with no speculator, that's what all the end buyer was going to do too. So what we said before is that without royalties, in this case, the optimal thing the creator could do was set P to maximize P times probability V is bigger than P, because that's all they can get without royalties. Because the speculator is only going to buy if the if the secondary market is going to buy, if the buyer on this time two is going to buy, and so we said from Markov's inequality, the speculator cannot get P of V anymore. But actually, it's easy to see even without doing any um, real math, you can get a, a boundary condition here. In this case, the speculator, I mean the the creator can just set P equals zero and give away the unit and say the, set the royalty rate to be one. And then the speculator, and then the creator can claim all of the valuation because the creator, the creator basically gives the unit to the speculator and then takes all the revenue from the speculator. So the creator can kind of become the speculator. And so this is sort of a funny um, situation to say that the price is zero and the royalties are one. But actually, we see, and I mentioned before, that actually a lot of um, uh, a lot of NFT collections do this. They don't set the royalty rate to one because that would be crazy, but they do set the price to be zero. And the reason they don't set the royalty rate to one is here in this what I've described. The the speculator has no outside option, right? They're willing to do to participate even if their profit is you know zero or infinitesimal. But if you give the if you give the speculator an outside option that they're only willing to participate as a speculator and they make some minimal amount of money, then you can still get a, a, um, an optimal where the price is zero and now R is strictly less than one. And the, the equations get a little bit more complicated, um, but uh, the, you can get basically much closer. You can get higher revenues for the creator by essentially like piggybacking on the extra knowledge of the speculator by setting a high royalty rate. Um, does that make sense? Okay. Um, so then the third um, model that I wanted to talk about 
is um, uh, actually just on this um, uh, so new news here. One thing is we also scraped a lot of data from the royalty rates of different um, different collections. And as I pointed out before, like the big collections had fairly low royalty rates, like two and a half percent, five percent, seven and a half percent. We did find a couple of NFTs which had royalty rates as high as ninety five percent. Um, and these were, it turns out, um, mostly fraudulent NFTs. They were copies of other collections where somebody would make a copy of a famous collection like Bored Apes, but then mint it and have the royalty rate set to about 95% and um, in hopes that it could get a few trades in before people noticed. Um, but, but you do see on the blockchain some royalty rates that are actually quite high, um, but they're mostly scams. Um, and that, yeah, the, the third model I want to consider was multiple units. So the first two models with risk aversion, we just said for simplicity, imagine there's one unit and for, um, uh, for the information asymmetry, we also said the set creator has one unit. Now let's say, suppose the creator has multiple units, right? Because again, the, the motivating NFT collections that we considered all had you know, about 10,000 units. And, um, and the thing that goes on here is that almost all of these NFT collections mint all of the NFTs at the same price. So, so the way it works, if you haven't participated in these mints, something like Bored Apes will announce, we are minting our Bored Apes. And what that means is you can come to the Bored Ape contract and buy one for 0.080 until they're sold out. Um, and because a lot of the high powered collections did this at the beginning, there's a strong social pressure for everyone who's creating a new NFT collection to essentially adopt this mechanism where you just have a fixed price to sell all your units. Um, and what this means is that the creator can't price discriminate. If there are some buyers who have a higher valuation and some who have a lower valuation, they're still going to sell at all the same price. And if we assume now, what if the speculator has no such restriction? The speculator comes and they buy everything up and then they go and they sell the NFTs on the secondary market, like on OpenSea. You can post them for any prices that you want. And so you can sell some to um, buyers with higher valuation and some at a lower price to buyers of low valuation. And it seems like royalties allow um, the creators to piggyback off of this extra power that the speculator has. So again, sort of the motivating idea here is that if the creator is limited either by um, their information or they're limited by the mechanism they can use to sell these things, but the speculator is not, then the royalties allow the creator to capture some of the speculator uh, revenue. So here's the simplest way you can operationalize this. Instead of 10,000 units, we just say the creator has two units, um, but the creator still has to set a single price P and a single royalty rate R. And the speculator then shows up and the speculator as always doesn't care about the NFTs at all. They just wanna resell them. But now the speculator's decision is not whether to purchase or not. The speculator can choose to purchase zero, one or two and at this price P. And then at time two, demand is realized. And here's how our demand now, which is we have two buyers and they both have demand V but they're just IID draws from the same distribution V. And as usual, the creator and the speculator both know V going into this, um, but at the time the creator sets the price, he doesn't know the draw, he doesn't know the realizations of V, and the speculator also doesn't know the realizations at the time they buy. So we've eliminated the information asymmetry. This is again just by itself is the multiple units collection. And now we assume again the speculator has good power to price discriminate. So if the speculator purchased one unit, they can sell it and they'll sell it to the higher valued buyer. Right, so now there are two buyers, they have different valuations. We assume that the speculator has a better ability, has better access to the market than the creator, that the speculator will sell first as they will advertise it on OpenSea or whatever, as opposed to forcing you to go to the original contract. Um, and if the speculator bought two units, then they'll sell to both buyers. And so they get, they get the valuation from both buyers. But the, the one sort of assumption we have to make is that if, if the speculator only bought one unit and the two buyers have different valuations, who, who gets to sell to the higher value buyer, right? And we're assuming it's the speculator. Um, 
And as usual, if the speculator did not purchase anything, the creator can still try to sell on the secondary market, but can't change its price. It's fixed into the contract. So here's um, uh, some plots of what happens. Imagine V is discrete. So V is this really simple thing that the buyer is willing to pay either one or two with probability one half. So you can say the buyer's valuation, 50% of the time the buyer is a low value buyer with valuation one, and at 50% of the time, it's a buyer with valuation two. And so the most you could ever hope to get from two buyers is two EV, right? That's the most they're willing to pay in expectation. And these plots show um, what the creator is going to get. And these plots look really jagged, but actually, if you think about it, it makes a lot of sense. So this line, so this, this purple line is the R equals zero with no royalties. So let's think about that as the baseline. As the creator sets the price higher and higher, the, their revenue goes up and up because this is what happens if the price is low enough, the speculator will buy both units. And as long as the speculator is going to buy both units and there's no royalty rate, then um, your price increases, your revenue increases linearly in price. Right? If I double the price and the creator is still going to buy both units, I get double the revenue. At some point, the creator says, you know what, I'm not going to buy two units anymore. I'm only going to buy one. And you get a discontinuous drop in the, in the creator revenue. And when does the um, creator, when does the speculator decide to drop? It's not at the low price. It's in between. And it's based on um, right how much if the creator only sorry if the speculator only buys one unit, they get the max value here, right? And what's the expectation of the max here? Well, three quarters of the time the max is two, right? And one quarter of the time the max is one. If you take the maximum of two values, right? For the max will be two if either one is two. And so that happens three quarters of the time. And the max will be one if they're both one, which happens one quarter of the time. And so at the point, which is three quarters times two plus one quarter times one, you get, uh, you, you get this split, right? And this is, and then this is the place where the buyer, I sorry, where the speculator buys exactly one unit. And then you have a third drop or second drop where the speculator says, I'm not buying anything. Right. Um, and now, um, if you if you add royalties, the the creator gets more. And again, you see these drops depending on how the um, speculator tries to buy. Here, the speculator buys one. Oh, sorry, here's the speculator buys two when the price is low. Right. Um, and here, the speculator is buying zero. And these two lines overlap when the speculator is buying zero in both cases. Um, it doesn't matter if you get royalties or not because you only get royalties from the speculator sales. And so these lines overlap. Um, but the thing to notice is that you get more and R equals 0.5 is not the optimal royalty rate. You can get more by um, uh, increasing the royalties further. And you can show that in this really simple model, you basically want to set the, um, you want to set the price to get this point. This point is always gonna be the highest where the speculator buys two. You wanna set the, the highest price where the speculator is willing to buy two. And in the case where the speculator has no outside options so where they're willing to accept you know, zero net profit, um, you can make that really high. But uh, in any case, the, the optimal thing is to set the, the royalties, they set the price where the, um, speculator buys two. And you can do the same thing with a, disc, with a continuous distribution. So this is where the, the buyer had a discrete distribution. The secondary buyer was just one of these two. Um, suppose the buyer's valuation V is exponentially distributed. You get the same kind of behavior. So here, when the price is low, so the x-axis writes the price and the y-axis is the creator revenue as we're interested in the creators. Here is the, the speculators buying two and the price goes up. And then at some point they stop and they only buy one. 
and here the price goes up as they're buying one, and at some point they stop and they buy zero. And it's the same thing with when there's royalties, there's still some price where it goes up. Um, and I put this dotted line so you can see that with royalties, this line, this peak is a little bit higher here. But it's interesting in the discrete case, it's pretty easy to prove that the optimal thing is to set the price to the speculator buys two. Here, the optimal thing is actually to set where the, the speculator buys one for a fixed royalty rate. Um, but the, the point is that, again, in this case, where the, the speculator has additional powers that the um, creator doesn't have this power of essentially selling at different prices, the royalties allow the creator to kind of piggyback off of this um, speculator's ability to get extra revenue. So those were the-, uh, Brad, the Did you mention the optimal royalty rate in the previous settings? Or? I did not exactly. So in the case where um, if you don't give the buyer, sorry, if you don't give the speculator an outside option, then you can just push the royalty rate all the way up to one again and have the um, creator extract everything from the speculator. Um, okay. As soon as you give the, the speculator an outside option, you, you push it down a little you bit. It to. depends on, yeah, it depends essentially on how much, what's the minimum amount of revenue the speculator is willing to accept. Okay. Um, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Um, okay. So. Yes, there's a question in the chat. Is royalty rate determined at the minting in the model? Some collections lower their royalty rates for the secondary sales. So perfect segue here. So um, the thing I want to talk about now is enforcement of royalties. Okay. So in order to talk about how are royalties enforced, um, we need a quick primer on how NFTs work. So an NFT collection like Bored Apes is one contract. There's one contract for all 10,000 Bored Apes. And that contract essentially implements a database with two columns with the token ID column and the name of the owner, the address of the person who owns that token ID. And so when Bob um, wants to transfer, Bob owns token three, and when Bob wants to transfer token three, say board ape number three to Alice, he will call the transfer function on this contract. And the contract will just update this row in the database. Um, and the contract will not alert Alice to this. So any model you've heard of you say like, I have an NFT in my wallet, like that's a really bad abstraction. Alice doesn't have an NFT in her wallet. Bob doesn't have an NFT in her wallet. The NFT, Ownership is determined exclusively by the NFT contract and by specifically by the little database in the NFT contract. And if Alice wants to know that she has an NFT, she will read from this database. Um, and so the reason I bring this up is that the NFT contract knows when the NFT was transferred because it, it, it has the ownership record, but it does not know if it was a sale or a gift. And if it was a sale, it has no idea what the sale price was. And so this makes enforcing royalties, especially enforcing like pro rata royalties, really difficult because the NFT contract doesn't know what the sale price was. So in practice, most NFTs are sold on exchanges like OpenSea and OpenSea maintains its own set of contracts. And when a buyer comes in and says, hey, you know what, I'd like to buy some NFT for three ETH. Then Bob, if Bob wants to sell to Alice, the exchange contract will act as a sort of escrow authority. Bob, what Bob will do, Bob will call his NFT contract and said, I approve the exchange to transfer my token on my behalf. And then he tells the exchange, hey, I do want to sell my NFT for three ETH. And then the exchange is going to call the NFT contract and change the ownership of the NFT to Alice. And that will work because Bob has already approved the exchange to do that. And then um, the exchange will pay Bob. And so this is how sales on um, the blockchain work now, basically. And the nice thing about this is that basically, although the NFT contract knows when it's been transferred, it doesn't know the sale price, but the exchange contract here, like OpenSea, does know the sale price. And so 
what was alluded to in the question is that now who is going to enforce this um, NFT uh, royalty, right? The NFT contract can't really enforce it by itself because it doesn't know the sale price. And um, it's, it's not really possible for the NFT contract to really know the sale price because you can always imagine sort of out of band transfers, right? I could say, I'm willing to give you my board ape in exchange for a briefcase full of cash. And there's no way that the NFT contract would ever know about the existence of that briefcase full of cash. So somebody has to inform the, the NFT contract or uh, about the royalty rate. Um, but the buyer and the seller are incentivized to misreport the sale price, right? They're incentivized to report a really low sale price. You could imagine an NFT contract that says, hey, what, is, um, what was the sale price so that I know how much royalties to charge? But both the buyer and seller don't want to pay royalties, right? So they're incentivized to say, hey, the sale price was zero. So who actually enforces these? Well, the marketplace like OpenSea um, knows the sale price and the marketplace will then often enforce the royalties. And this has created a very strange dynamic. So there are actually multiple ways that um, NFT contracts can ask for royalties. So a standard one, I don't have this here, um, is this EIP 2981, where in the NFT contract, there's a call that just says, it, it just is a basically a statement, I would like 5% royalties. It doesn't enforce it. It's just a, basically a flag saying, please give me 5% royalties. That's one way to ask. Another way is to just do it completely off chain. And when you go to the marketplace like OpenSea and you ask, you can, when you sign up at OpenSea, you say, I would like OpenSea to um, get me 5% royalties. And because OpenSea was the one who's going to be reporting the sale price anyway, they actually don't need to do any of that on chain. And so um, like when I said at the beginning that Bored Apes had a 5% royalty rate, if you look at the Bored Ape contract on the Ethereum blockchain, there is no royalty in it at all. There's no even request for royalties. The 5% comes from, they went later and asked OpenSea for 5% royalties. And so, they can also then go back later to OpenSea and change that. And what's started to happen is that um, the, the marketplaces, which initially almost all supported royalties, basically stopped enforcing royalties uh, as the, the market dropped out of you know, a lot of the blockchains and um, also NFTs, the, there was sort of more competition for the exchanges. And a lot of the exchanges said, you know what, we're just gonna stop enforcing royalties altogether in hopes of attracting more buyers. Because if you can buy the same NFT for 5% less on our site, maybe you'll come to our exchange instead. So there's been a big brouhaha about um, whether the exchanges have some like moral obligation to enforce royalties. But this is all coming about because the, there's no way on chain to enforce the royalties and there's no way on chain to enforce the royalties because there's no way for the contract to know what the sale price was. Um, and so this is the last thing I wanted to say about this was um, there are some alternatives, right? The, the problem with automatic enforcement of royalties is that you you can't enforce a royalty rate like a royalty percentage because you don't know the sale price but it would actually be very easy to have a fixed creator fee. And maybe you wouldn't call it a royalty, but you say every time you transfer this, you have to pay you know, 0.1 ETH to the creator. And so now the creator doesn't earn um, a fraction of the sale, but they earn a fixed value for every transfer, right? This, this is very easy to enforce. There are lots of issues with this, right? That the creators maybe want to capture some of the upside if the, the actual NFT skyrockets, right? Everybody's hoping that their NFT will go up a million fold um, and a, a fixed creator fee doesn't really help with that. The other issue is the contract can't distinguish if you wanna move an NFT between one of your wallets um, and you had a fixed creator fee, you'd have to pay to move this NFT between your own wallets. Um, 
Another thing that's sort of more of a thought experiment than anything you do in practice is the notion of like probabilistic reversion. It would be straightforward to implement an NFT contract that says every time the NFT is transferred, there's like a 5% probability that the transfer doesn't go through as requ requested, but instead just transfers ownership of the NFT right back to the creator. So in expectation, this means that the creator gets 5% of the value on every sale, even if the creator doesn't know what the sale price was, because 5% of the time, the creator just takes hold of the, the NFT, right? Obviously, this um, has, you know, huge problems that buyers and sellers would not sort of like this mechanism, because if you pay full price and um, you're in that 5% category where you don't get the NFT, but the creator does, um, that's, that's not something that you would like. Um, another type of alternative is a kind of buyback clause. So you could put a buyback clause into the NFT contract to say that anytime there's a transfer, the, the creator has the right to purchase the NFT at some fixed price. Now, unfortunately, you can't say they have like the right of first refusal to purchase the NFT at the sale price, because again, the contract can't know the sale price. So the buyback price must be fixed, but you could have this buyback clause in there. But the problem with something like this is that this means this would put a cap on the value of the NFT on the secondary market. If there was a buyback clause that said, anytime you transfer this board eight, the creator can buy it back for 10 ETH, then nobody would ever be willing to purchase it for more than 10 ETH, right? Um, and that again sort of makes it so the creator can't capture this sort of huge upside in the market that they're hoping for. But these, although sort of all of these alternatives are not great, um, I wanted to bring them up sort of to get people thinking that um, there are these benefits to giving sort of fees back to the creator in some way. And there's huge problems with the royalties that they can't be enforced. And so it'd be really interesting to think about sort of these alternatives that are enforceable with current contracts, um, but uh, also give some power back to the uh, creators or give some revenue back to the creators. So thanks. Thank you, Brett. Very nice uh, paper. Uh, we are almost out of time here, but if there is a quick question from the audience, we can entertain that. Any questions? If you want to raise your hand. Okay. Uh, can you, uh, Brett, can you stop sharing? Yeah. Yep. Thanks. All right. All right. I think we're going to go to the next paper now. Uh, and that is reaching for yield in the decentralized financial markets. Uh, that's, that's a paper by Patrick Augustan, Roy, Roy Chen Zhang, Donghua Shen. Uh, Donghua is going to present it. Donghua, you're all set. Okay. Take Can you it hear away. me well? Yeah. Okay, great. Thanks for inviting me to present my paper. Uh, this is a joint work with Patrick Augustine at McGill and Roy Chen Zhang. Roy is uh, a wonderful finance PhD student at UNC Kinan Flagler. Okay, in this paper, we study decentralized finance or in short DeFi. DeFi is a collection of financial services offered through smart contracts on blockchain. And this market has grown rapidly over time. This blue line plus the, uh, the size of total value lock in early 2020, it was very small, like nearly like zero. And over the next uh, three or two to three years, this market has grown rapidly. So it hits about like $20 billion at its peak. Well, yeah, of course we observe the significant drop around this time. This is mainly caused by the huge uh, crash of uh, cryptocurrency market. And it's uh, actually, there's not a very big uh, outflow from the DeFi platforms. So probably the more um, uh, informative uh, figure is this red line that plus the number of active DeFi platforms, this has been consistently increasing over time. So the main takeaway from this figure is we observe the rapid growth of DeFi market. However, this growth has raised concerns by the SEC. DeFi platforms attract uh, the, uh, liquidity providers by offering high and salient yields. And many DeFi products, DeFi securities, are similar to complex retail derivatives in a sense that they are quite complex. Despite risk and complexity, however, uh, many DeFi securities are easily accessible to retail investors and therefore this, this is quite concerning. 
then what do we do in this paper? In this paper, we study a particular type of beef life products, yield farm. Uh, we first provide a conceptual framework to understand return uh, risk and return trade-offs, and we study mechanisms of reaching for yield in markets where uh, traditional financial intermediaries do not exist like banks. We leverage a large cross-section of farm and investor level data obtained from blockchain, and we exploit heterogeneous information shock that reduce complexity and change the salience of um, specific feature of our yield farms to understand relationship of reaching for yield to complexity, salience, and risk shrouding. Uh, then what are our main empirical findings? First, we uh, find that investors chase high yield farms that eventually underperform. And this underperformance is amplified by hidden costs and investor mistakes. And at the end of this presentation, I'm going to show you that uh, information disclosure eventually uh, res uh, reduces investors' propensity to chase yield. So which can be uh, useful for them to achieve high, higher return. Okay, we, we mainly speak to three different literatures. One is uh, investor behavior and reaching for yield, especially for Dalla, Chinayoli, uh, Chinayoli and Schlaefer. Uh, they find that reaching for yield can arise in the presence of investor salience uh, bias uh, with fierce competition between financial intermediaries. And uh, the second literature is on complex financial securities, where most of the paper, the vast majority of paper find that uh, financial intermediaries make the uh, financial products more complicated and uh, to hide risk inside of it and uh, sell it at high price to exploit in investors' lack of sophistication. And we, we have a growing literature on DeFi. There are a number of papers and I'm pretty sure that I missed so, so many things. And many papers focus on the specific mechanics to understand specific mechanics of specific uh, DeFi platforms and its implication. And we take a completely different approach in this paper. Uh, we use yield farms as a useful laboratory to study reaching for yield in high yield complex securities. We don't have banks here. However, we have platforms. Here, platforms compete for investors' attention via uh, salient yields. And what's nice is we can observe many things, probably, I mean, almost everything about the investors and the, the yield farms. We observe investor flow, their investment decision in their information set or the salient features of yield farms and so on, which is quite rare in the, the existing literature on complex financial securities, where most of the, the uh, result on um, the paper focus on like uh, understanding the, uh, the deal characteristic of uh, financial products. So it can um, give us an opportunity to, to learn more about uh, the mechanism of reaching for yield. So here's the roadmap of my presentation today. I'm going to briefly explain about the concept of yield farming and explain why uh, studying yield farming is so important in the current context. And I'll provide a very a simple conceptual framework and I will discuss about our data and empirical analysis. And based on this uh, empirical analysis, I will uh, provide a simple uh, policy implication and conclude. What is yield farming? Yield farming is uh, earning passive income as compensation for liquidity provision to DeFi platforms. Conceptually, at a first glance, this is somewhat similar to securities lending. However, as you will see, there, uh, there is a big difference between this and uh, yield farming. In order to explain the concept of yield farming on a decentralized exchange, let me use this simple figure. Uh, okay, there is a one uh, liquidity pool in a decentralized exchange. So it has USDT and ETH inside. In order to make a market so that traders can trade against it, we need liquidity provider who first purchase these two tokens, USDT and ETH, uh, and then inject it to a uh, liquidity pool. What's important here is the, the dollar amount of these two cryptocurrency deposited into liquidity pool should be the same. Okay, now we have a um, trader who wants to sell ETH or he, he may want to buy ETH uh, by trading against it. And the price at which he can trade is actually determined by an interesting model called constant product model, which I believe many people already know in this audience. Okay, uh, so this is how liquidity, by the way, after liquidity provision, this liquidity provider received LP token, which is a certificate of ownership. 
Okay, we now understand the basic of this liquidity provision and, and trading here. Uh, then uh, why do you think uh, the liquidity provider want to provide liquidity to the uh, liquidity pool? The reason is uh, they earn some income. They are facing several uh, risks and as a compensation, they should earn income and that income is coming from the trading volume. So in PancakeSwap, which we study in this paper, uh, investors, uh, not investors, traders pay 0.25% of their trading volume as trading fee and a significant portion of this is going to the liquidity provider. And this is an important source of income. However, this income may not be sufficient uh, to compensate all the risk that invent, uh, the liquidity providers can, can take. So in, in that situation, in, in some uh, DeFi platform, in order to further incentivize this uh, liquidity provider, they give additional income in the form of their own token or own governance token. In pancake swap, they uh, mint this cake token and give this to the liquidity provider. If this liquidity provider uh, stake their LP token in the, the main uh, staking contract. So this is how yield farming is done. So if the yield farmer uh, goes through all this process, then he has two sources of, two sources of income. One is uh, the trading fee revenue, the other is farm yield uh, paid in cake. Then you can ask then, uh, what is the source of this cake income? So in order to explain the concept, so let me use another figure. So we have multiple uh, polls here. And uh, as I said before, uh, traders needs to pay 0.25% of the total trading volume as fee. And out of 0.25%, 0.17% is going to the liquidity provider as income. And the remaining 0.08% is going to uh, PancakeSwap main contract. And what does this smart contract does? It, it means uh, the, its own native token or governance token at the end of every block, the 40 case. But if it continues to uh, just issue, just mint this arcade tokens because of this inflation pressure, the token value should drop significantly. So what it does is actually it buys back a significant portion of this cake token based on this revenue that they, that they receive from the trading to support the price. Then some of the farm, uh, some of the pools become yield farms. In this case, uh, out of this four liquidity pool, two uh, liquidity pool becomes farm. For this, in this farm, the liquidity provider not only received these trading fees, but also received the farm yield. But these, uh, um, in this liquidity pool, which is are not farms, liquidity provider only received the, the fraction of the trading volume as their income. So this is kind of the cross subsidization between the liquidity provider. And the, the choice of this uh, yield farm and also how much uh, K token that uh, each yield farm will receive, this is, is uh, decided by the platform governance team. If you have yield uh, K token, you can participate in governance and you can use the platform, uh, interesting platform services. Okay, so I explained the, uh, the concept of yield farming briefly. Then um, why is studying yield farming so important? First, it is related to investor protection issue. Yield farming looks quite simple and it is quite easily accessible to retail investors. However, indeed, uh, yield farming is quite complex in both execution and payoffs with hidden risk. And this is not uh, complex only to retail investor or small investor. Uh, there are uh, in some uh, sophisticated investors like Alameda Research who also actively involved in yield farming. For example, in our uh, data, we, we, we studied, uh, we analyzed the on-chain data in uh, SushiSwap and find that yield, uh, Alameda Research invested about $300 million in, in yield farming. And there is some suggested evidence of underperformance and, and mistake. So that's why um, in investor pr uh, protection perspective, uh, studying yield farming is quite important. Not only that, yield farming is important uh, in, in surviving this competitive environment. The market for DeFi is getting more and more competitive over time, as you have seen in the first figure. And in this environment, yield farming can be a powerful device to ensure long-term growth of DeFi platform. Why? For example, 
we already have a very big uh, decentralized exchange like Uniswap. Suppose I want to start a new decentralized exchange, and it is very hard for me to compete with Uniswap because Uniswap already is very well established, has a lot of liquidity. So there is no clear reason why uh, investors need to come to my exchange and trade here because they have a better term at, at Uniswap due to high liquidity, large liquidity. So in this kind of environment, in order to compete against the large and existing um, competitor, uh, short-term um, subsidy to uh, specific farms, specific pool can be useful. So that's why you know, farming is important for the platforms as well. So let me provide very simple conceptual framework. Uh, yield farmers return in a decentralized exchange are decomposed into four parts. The first part is uh, the easiest part, uh, capital gain. As I said before, in order to become a liquidity provider or yield farmer, you have to first purchase two different cryptocurrencies and deposit it, and their dollar amount should be identical. That's why we have this one over two and one over two in this uh, equation. And uh, we have this um, trading fee part. So which is um, the income that in, uh, the liquidity provider can receive. If you have only these two, then it looks somewhat similar to securities lending, except that uh, this, uh, in this case, we have two cryptocurrency rather than one. What makes this very different from securities lending is this impermanent loss. Your uh, price risk is not just about like capital gain, the, uh, but actually it has additional component called il, uh, impermanent loss, which looks quite complicated. So this is always negative, as you can easily see. And um, as these two cryptocurrency move in the same direction, this impermanent loss is not very big. However, if they are uncorrelated or if they are negatively correlated, this part becomes bigger and investor's loss becomes bigger. So if you uh, buy two cryptocurrency and inject this into the liquidity pool and it is uh, trading revenue, we say that this is liquidity mining. However, as I said before, some platforms like PancakeSwap, SushiSwap, and many other uh, decentralized exchange and DeFi platform, they provide additional opportunity uh, in the form of farm yield. So if you stake your LP token to the farm, then you can earn additional income called farm yield. Then if you add all these things, then this is the, yield, the return on yield farming. So the previous page shows the, the return uh, in the frictionless market. There's no friction. However, in, uh, in the blockchain, there are so much frictions. Uh, in the interest of time, let me very briefly explain the concept. So let's start from this guess. What is guess? Guess is the amount of money that you have to pay to the miners whenever you make any transaction on blockchain. And this has nothing to do with the size of your investment. IT is a size of investment. So guess divided by IT, this is, um, the guess, uh, the, the, the amount of return decreased driven by this gas fee. And if your size of investment is very small, as you can see here, this part becomes huge. And therefore it lowers your return a lot. And we have another uh, component uh, colored in red. The first component colored in red is related to uh, trading fee. In order to become a uh, yield farmer, you have to buy cryptocurrencies, right? When you buy, you have to pay fees. And when you unwind your position after you uh, receive uh, some cryptocurrencies from a uh, liquidity pool, then you have to sell them, then you also need to pay. That's why we have this term. And we have this lambda term. This is related to price impact. This is a function of F. F is uh, I divided by LT. I is your size of investment. And LT is a size of liquidity pool. So if your investment size is so large, then whenever you want to buy or sell cryptocurrencies, then there's a huge price impact that will lower your, your return. That's why uh, we have this uh, term. Another interesting term is in front, of, in front of this realized farm yield. After we earn the farm yield in fake token or uh, in governance token in general, we have to convert it to the US dollar. Then at that time we have to pay fee. That's why we have the first component. Another interesting component is this K star. What is this? I mean, what's the point of doing uh, uh, conduct? Uh, uh, what's the point of doing yield farming? You want to stake your LP token and earn additional income. But what's very interesting is in the data we find that not all invest, not all yield farmers actually stake their LP tokens. So this is actually uh, ideally has to be one, but is actually empirically less than one. 
So uh, uh, we, we mm, claim that this has to do with investor mistake. Okay, so this is the conceptual framework to compute the investor's return with uh, various types of frictions, which we are going to um, use to uh, quantify, precisely quantify the return on, on yield farming. So let me briefly discuss about, about our data. We mainly analyze um, pancake swap on Binance Smart Chain. Pancake swap is the second largest, uh, largest yield farm and second largest spot fix uh, in our sample period. And uh, at the very end of our, our paper, we also analyzed uh, some, some sushi swap data as well on top of this. Our sample period is about two years, and we have two different data sets. One is uh, yield farm level data. For each farm, we have information about the size of liquidity, total trading, volume, yield, and so on, the yield farm characteristic. We, we con uh, collect this data by analyzing the farm-related uh, smart contracts. And another interesting data set is a farmer level data, yield farmer level data, which is quite unique and which is very also quite hard to get in traditional financial market. And it, con it contains in all histories of farmers activity, liquidity provision, staking, unstaking, and so on. So let me show you a uh, stylized fact about farms first. The first uh, fact is uh, the yield is pretty high. Average yield in our sample period was about 77.6%. And as you can see here, uh, we, uh, we, we observed a significant cross-sectional uh, heterogeneity, and also we see a huge time variation as well. And another important uh, fact is yield is salient, but uh, the other informations are hidden. For example, if you take a look at this, this is the, the user interface of yield farming at PancakeSwap. This is, looks quite cute and funny. And if you go to this uh, uh, yield farm page, you can see several numbers. The APR, this is yield. Liquidity, this is size of liquidity pool. Multiplier, this is basically one input that determines this yield. So basically what we have here is two, two variables, yield and size of liquidity. And even if you click many things, we don't get uh, many additional information. We don't have any information about risk and historical performance which can be used for, for investors uh, uh, investors' decision, but we don't, uh, this platform does not provide that information. So only yield is salient. And yield from is complex uh, investment strategy. As you have seen in the uh, uh, to, uh, previous slides, the payoff is quite complex. We have three underlying assets, and we also have some non-linearity coming from impermanent loss. And execution is complex as well in order to start and in order to unwind your position and close your um, uh, exit on yield farming, you have to go through about 14 transactions, which is pretty high. So here in the interest of time, let me briefly explain how yield is determined. Yield, Y-I-T, I, I here is uh, the index for farm. This is constant times small MIT divided by big MIT. So a small MIT is called multiplier, which you have seen in the previous uh, slide to, uh, on the first on the screen of the yield farms. This is the called uh, this is called multiplier, and this is determined by platform governance team. And this big M is just a summation of all small M I. So basically, this C times small M divided by big M. This is the number of cake tokens allocated to specific farm I over the next one year. And we multiply the price of cake in order to convert them into uh, the US dollar. And then we divide it by the size of liquidity pool because this uh, income is distributed across all the farmers. So in this table, what I did is then uh, what affects the, uh, the decision of this platform governance team? Basically what it tells is it actually makes a strong farm even stronger and weaker farm, weak farm even weaker. Strong farm by by uh, by strong farm I mean is the farm that generates a lot of income. Weak farm is the farm that generates uh, the low uh, small amount of income. If the farm generates high income, it further increases its subsidy. If the farm does not generate enough income, it reduces its subsidy and sometimes it just completely decreased. So this is just uh, one factor that determines or that affects the the platform owner's decision, platform uh, governance team's decision. Okay, this is stylized facts about um, farmers. 
one interesting fact is um, we find some evidence consistent with the investors' lack of sophistication and attention. So as I said, the reason why people want to be of uh, want to do yield farming is because to earn additional income by staking their LP token in the staking contract. So the staking ratio, which is defined to be the amount of uh, LP token staked divided by the total amount of LP token, this should be ideally one, right? If everyone wants to um, earn additional income, right? However, as you can see in the data, empirically, this is not exactly the same as one. Its median is close to one, but there is a huge variation, meaning a lot of investors actually do not stake to earn this additional income, which is puzzling. And we see some huge drop in um, on one day in April 2022. On this day, there was an upgrade. Uh, this upgrade is, is like this. Uh, there was an old staking contract where all liquidity provider, all yield farmers had to stake their LP tokens to earn additional income. However, on a sudden day, this Pancake swap team announced that, oh, for technical reason, we have to make a new main staking contract. So all the yield farmer, you have to withdraw your LP tokens from the old uh, main staking contract and move it to the new main staking contract to earn income. If you don't do it, you don't earn this uh, farm yield. If that's the case, then everyone should withdraw it and move it to uh, the new contract, right? But as you can see, it we experience a significant drop on this date, and it takes so long time that it to for this to be recovered, right? And it's not fully recovered yet. So as time goes by, this is the remaining liquidity in the all staking puzzle, at all staking contract. If investors are quick enough, then they have this number should immediately go to zero. But that didn't happen. It takes so long time. Uh, that eventually uh, most of this uh, liquidity uh, is moved to the new contract. So this is one evidence of investors' lack of sophistication and uh, inattention. And we find some um, consistent suggestive evidence from survey finding. Although eight, almost 80% of farmers claim to understand risk and reward uh, of yield farming, only 33% 33, uh, 33 of the investors uh, say that they do not know what the impermanent loss is, although this is quite an important uh, measure that quantifies risk. We have additional uh, summary statistics on the farmer's uh, yield farming behavior. So the main takeaway from this is investors, uh, investor size is quite small. Although the size of the investment, the average is about $24,000, which is large, if you take a look at the distribution, its median is pretty low, only $150 or 75 percentile is also not very big, $700. And another interesting observation is this, this staking ratio is less than one, which is consistent with the previous figure. And this staking ratio is, uh, is related to, is possibly correlated with the size of investment. Uh, this is, we sort uh, the farmers by their average investment size. And as you can see uh, in the first quintile, uh, the staking ratio is about 0 0.6, and the largest or the, the highest quintile, quintile five, uh, although uh, the, the size of investment is very high, the staking ratio is not one, but it increases, but it's not exactly the same as one. This means that even large investors make mistake and lose a lot of, or, or for, for, um, give up a lot of opportunity to earn additional yield. All right, um, so let's go to the performance analysis. So we decomposed uh, the return into four pieces, as I have explained, uh, capital gain, uh, impermanent loss, trading fee revenue, and realized yield. And we first sort all the farms by offer deal, and therefore the realized yield uh, is mechanically uh, correlated with this, uh, this um, quintile. So the uh, quintile five has the highest realized yield, but if you take a look at trading fee, there is not a very big difference across uh, quintiles. But what's very interesting is capital gain part and impermanent loss. This is very low for the high yield farm. This one, um, the, the, so the main takeaway from this figure is that although high yield farms look quite lucrative based on the, um, the high yield, however, there is uh, a lot of risk in, in, in underlying assets. So capital gain is very bad and also uh, the impermanent loss is pretty low. So we do a little more analysis on this. At the end of every week, 
we sort all farms based on the offer deal. And then uh, we, we uh, make the evaluated portfolio. And um, in the first plot, we compare yield farming strategy and liquidity mining strategy. So yield farming, as I said, not only you provide liquidity and earn a uh, trading fee as, as revenue, but you stake your LP token in the main staking contract to earn additional yield. Liquidity mining, you don't stake the, uh, the LP token, you only uh, enjoy this uh, trading fee revenue. If we compute alpha, you can see that this liquidity mining is very unprofitable. So especially in Q4 and Q5 that offers high yield, we see that this alpha is negative and statistically significant. What about friction? So this uh, blue plot is uh, the, the alpha without uh, considering any frictions, but now we start to add transaction costs. Here, start, transaction cost is uh, includes gas fee, trading fee, uh, trading fee, and also price impact. So if we include this um, or take into account this uh, trading frictions, this alpha becomes smaller and smaller for these high yield farms. And if we add investor mistake, which is related to a lower, a low staking ratio, this one becomes even more aggressive in Q5 and Q4. So what does that mean? Seemingly lucrative farms perform worse after considering uh, frictions. And if uh, yield farming in Ethereum is likely to perform even worse. We are studying yield farming in Binance Smart Chain, where gas fee is pretty low. So the average gas fee for yield farming in um, Binance Smart Chain was only $3 in our sample period, but it was $270 in uh, Ethereum. So even if we didn't do, uh, even though we didn't do the proper analysis on uh, yield farming in Ethereum, it is likely that just based on this uh, high gas fee, it's really likely that investors, it's very hard for the investors to, to make uh, a lot of money from yield farming. In this simple table, we find uh, the relationship between the flow to the farm and the offer deal. As you can see, not very surprisingly, we find a positive relationship between the offered yield and flow. If the farm offers high yield, then it uh, attracts more flow. And we add in the second column, uh, the past return. Past return is insignificant. In column three, we decompose this past return into four pieces. The reason why I didn't include offered yield here is because it's highly correlated with a uh, realized deal. What's very interesting here in column three is impermanent loss has coefficient which is insignificant. Although this is an important uh, like measure that uh, quantifies the risk, uh, people don't seem to react to this uh, impermanent loss. That's what we find. And uh, this is farmer level uh, analysis. For each farmer, we compute their average return in yield farming. In column one and two, we don't consider the financial frictions. And in column three and four, in order to compute this average return, we take into account gas fee, price impact, and everything. And we regress this on uh, like average offered yield of the investors, uh, of, of the investors, and we also regress it on the size of the uh, investment and size of the investment square and the rebalancing frequency and so on. What's very interesting here is this average offered farm yield is negatively related with their uh, return. If investors just lightly chase yield, their, their average return is lower. Another inter interesting thing is this. So this uh, average size square has negative coefficient and average, uh, average, uh, and, and average size of investment has positive coefficient. This means that it is the hump shape. So if investors' investment size is too small, that negatively affects investors' return. And if investors' investment size is too large, then it also negatively affects the investors' return, uh, which is consistent with the conceptual framework, right? And if investors trade too much, then uh, it also negatively affects the investors' return. So in the very last part of this presentation, I'd like to briefly discuss about um, the impact of information disclosure in uh, the, the market for yield farming by using uh, two, two settings. The first setting is on uh, YieldWatch. YieldWatch is a customized, uh, customized information platform on yield farming. And YieldWatch token holder, this platform issues their own token. 
And if you buy this token, then you can access to more granular performance information. But another, inter another interesting thing about this setting is among all um, pancakes of farms, 234 farms, only 91 farms were displayed in this platform. And for this displayed farms, yield watch token holders can see the historical capital gain, impermanent loss, trading revenue, and realized yield, which is uh, the granular information about the performance. And this, this also means that yield, which was quite salient before, salient before becomes less salient by uh, if this information is revealed to additional information is revealed to the uh, yield watch token holders. So Conceptually, what we want to do is this. We have two different types of yield farmer, yield watch token holders and non-yield watch token holders. Yield watch token holders can access to this information, this platform, but he cannot access to this information. So basically, we want to measure the propensity to chase yield on these displayed farms and non-displayed farm and find the difference between these two. And we do the same thing for the non-yield watch token holders. And if investors' behavior change and therefore they chase yield less aggressively, then this difference in difference becomes uh, significant, uh, which we want to identify in this regression setup. So we this is the investor level data, and we regress this flow, future flow on offered yield first. And not surprisingly, there's a positive relationship between yield and flow, which we also observe in the farm level data. Now we use this triple interaction to capture what we want to quantify. As you can see, you find the negative coefficient and which is statistically significant and economic, economically significant across various uh, specifications. So uh, basically yield watch uh, token holders actually reduce their propensity to chase yield by about 22 to 36%. However, you can say that, oh, the purchasing decision of yield watch token is not exogenous, which is true. Some, uh, yield, uh, some investors want to buy this token, and that can be related to their uh, some unobservable investor characteristic that may affect our results. Although we have this interesting setting uh, of the di uh, discrepancy between dis uh, display farms and non-display farms. So in order to mitigate this concern, we want to provide additional evidence from an another uh, information platform called API Vision deployed on uh, Ethereum blockchain, not Binance Smart Chain. What they did is they did uh, multiple airdrops. Airdrop is uh, choosing the, uh, the, the number of people randomly and distribute their own tokens. So through these 20 airdrops, they uh, distribute, they chose randomly about like 630 uh, people and distribute their NFT tokens. So if they have NFT tokens and they can access to the, the, the similar information. And among these 600 NFT receiver, we only focus on farmers and sushi swap. So our final sample is about 60 traded investors and 18,000 control investors. And unlike uh, Yield Watch, all sushi swap farms are displayed in API vision. So first, uh, this is very preliminary analysis. We, we did the same exercise. We regressed the flow on the offer yield first. As you can see, there's a positive relationship between these two. And we also add the interaction between this offer yield and uh, the dummy for holding these NFT tokens. And as you can see, this NFT token holders, a propensity to chase yield becomes much smaller after they receive it. So what are the related policy implications? We all know that implementing any regulation in the cryptocurrency market is costly because it requires global coordination. In this environment, it would be useful to provide proper information regarding yield farming risk for investor protection. Okay, let me conclude. Yield farming in DeFi is a complex financial security, and we use uh, unique data to study reaching for yield with um, salience, complexity and risk shrouding. Our main empirical findings are quite uh, consistent with the theory of salience. And regarding future work, we wanted to um, make our uh, result much more robust through this many, many check like uh, matching or many other empirical techniques. And also we are interested in uh, studying the heterogeneous effect of um, this uh, access, accessing to additional information. 
to, to explore the channel that drives this result. Thank you very much. Thank you, Donghua. A very nice uh, paper. Okay, then I'm going to thank you all for coming uh, for uh, a set of two great papers and another successful CVER event. So thank you all. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you for having me.